Why don't we stand and start? And uh, we're going to start with some more.
name is Sarah. I'll be your host. Uh, I'm taking you a few of through announcements before we continue through with our worship. So the first one is we just want to stay in the loop with what's happening with you, um, your life, your needs, hopes, dreams, ideas. Um, so if you have, if you're new or you just have something you'd like to share with us, prayer requests, praises, um, go ahead and fill out the green tear off on your program. You can drop that off at the Welcome Center where I will be or into one of the boxes in the gathering space. And then we have stitches coming up. This is just a morning to gather together, um, do some crafting together. Um, we generally make these hats, scarves, mittens, and donate them. And, and you know, the weather is getting cold. There are people out there who do have a need for these items. So if you have experience or don't have experience, they will welcome you in and teach you and put you to work making these much needed gifts of love. So if you're interested in joining Stitches, the date and time are in your program. And then we have a date night coming up. It is November 13th at 6 o'clock right here. There will be trivia, so you might want to brush up on your random tidbits of knowledge. Um, child care will be provided, but we do ask that you sign up so we can have the proper amount of people to tend to the children. And then worshiping through generosity. Um, I know we say a lot of times like giving back of our finances, money, is just one way that we can give back to God what he's already given us because everything we have comes from God. Everything we we touch, feel, our breath, everything is a gift from God. And you know, so we talk about how this is one way we can do it, but maybe you're like, well, Sarah, what are the other ways we can live as a sacrifice to God? So fun you ask. But I was, <laughs> I, I'm one of those people who always scribble in my Bible and take notes. And the other day I stumbled across the um, four L's of being a living sacrifice. And I thought it was something I could share. So the first L is with your lips, which y'all just did with your worship. You know, praising God, giving life, giving words to others. You know, use your lips to be a sacrifice. The second one is your love, your heart, your time, your care, your energy, pouring it out into a world that much needs the love. Next is your life. And next to that I had wrote, give your whole life through the whole of your life. So give it all. No matter what the day throws at you, give it all, give it to God. And then the fourth one would be with your loot. Trusting God with your loot, I know. You want to give me a little pirate noise? Or oh. <laughs> but <laughs> you're a loot. Because you know, you can't can take it with us, guys. So let's use it to glorify God. Let's let's trust Him. Let's lean into that discomfort that we have around our money. Because I grew up with not much. And it was really, really hard for me to step into tithing and giving and trusting God with it. But boy, once you do, He blesses you. So one of those four areas, lips life, love, loot, if you just want to step a little bit more into it this week, spend some time with him, figure out which one is the one that you kind of shy away from, and then go a little deeper, trust him a little bit more, I think you'd be amazed at the way he turns that back around into a further blessing upon your life. So, if you guys could pray with me. Oh, Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this morning, we thank you for this day, we thank you for this time together, Lord, and I pray that we all are able to just take a deep breath and breathe out the stresses, the trials, the tribulations, the concerns, the worries, breathe it all out and breathe in your calming Holy Spirit that is in this place with us this morning. Take away the weights and give us your light, easy yoke, Lord. Be with us this morning, be with Dana as he shares. Speak to our hearts. And Lord, just bless us. Amen. We've sung this song a couple times. Um, but the chorus, like I've said before, is just the word holy. You are holy. And what that word means biblically is means set apart. That there is no one like him. So as we sing that phrase... 
I just I love the thought of just raising him above all of the things in life. All these things that we enjoy and that are beautiful and that are good, they still all pale in comparison to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and the reason why we have breath in our lungs this morning. So as we sing holy, picture yourself raising him above all of the things in your life and saying that he is God and you're not.
one of my favorite hymns. It just teaches me as much as I enjoy to sing it. The lyrics are just so scriptural and so beautiful. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm to the fiercest drought and storm. What a heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still and striking cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took our flesh. Fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones He gave to save. Sin upon that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin. How's everyone doing this morning? Good. Good? All right. Anybody else have a rough week? 
Yeah. And throw me in that pile, because uh, I definitely did as well. Um, I've been asked to give the message this morning, and I love giving messages, but it stresses me the poop out. <laughs> it's not really in my wheelhouse, but I, I enjoy it, but the preparation is just a nightmare for me. And so, part of it is I realized that it's a big responsibility. Like in the Word of God, it says those who teach are held accountable for what they teach. And so when I teach, I really want to make sure that what I'm sharing is scripturally accurate and it is literally what God says. And so uh, I'm going to do my best to do that this morning with everything that I can. And uh, we're going to continue in on the, the Mind Games sermon series. And... When I thought about that, and when I thought about what I might want to preach about, and I thought about the different mind games that I've seen the enemy play in my own mind, and some friends of mine, and people that I've talked with over the years, it's this very, very foundational, subtle lie that I think we fight and experience and hear as we walk out our relationship with Christ and that fundamental accusation that the enemy subtly whispers to us, are you really saved? In the last handful of years, it's been a really challenging year in a lot of different ways um, with health issues and then the pandemic and then just the craziness of culture and how crazy things are getting and how many conspiracy theories there are, and how many things about, is this the end times? Is Jesus getting ready to come back? And it certainly looks like there's a lot of things pointing towards that. And it's made me really face mortality, all these things, a lot more over the last few years. And just part of it's getting older, too, and just realizing how quickly life goes by. And so I know that's a really bright and cheery way to start a message, but... Um, <laughs> Even before the last few years, even before that, I know that I've gone through seasons in my life where I just wasn't living the way that I wanted to live. I didn't feel like I was as close to God as I wanted to be. I was stuck in some sin patterns. I was stuck in addictions. I was stuck in things that I was ashamed of. And I would hear that subtle whisper from the enemy Are you really a believer? Good Christians would do that. And I talk to a lot of people over the years, and, and I don't think I'm alone in that. When we, when we go through seasons and we go through stuff where we have a lot of guilt or shame, and we, we easily can shift back to salvation resting on our shoulders of cleaning our life up instead of relying on the cross of Christ. And I see that in people, and I see that even in churches. You know, I see that in, in churches that there are legalistic churches, and then there are other churches that are more kind of free-flowing and it's all good, Jesus will forgive you, it doesn't matter what you do type churches. And I've been doing ministry for about 20 years. I travel around and do concerts and lead worship. And I remember early on in my ministry, I would go from church to church, and I would hear drastically different things on the pulpit from week to week on how that all played out. And I realized really quickly that if I didn't get into the Bible myself and really understand for myself what the Bible said and what I believed God said to be true, I was going nuts. Because from week to week, I was hearing very different applications of the same verses. And so you see this tension, these polar realities of grace versus works, and mercy and justice, and all these different things. And you meet different types of people, and we all are kind of wired in different ways based on how we're wired, how we were created, our life circumstances, the family that we grew up in, we can be, we can tend to have a bias toward
towards more of a free-flowing life attitude or more of like a, a type A, like you got to do the right things and if you do the right things then life's going to work out the way that you want it to. And I, I, I look at that as, because we learn at a really young age that if we play the game correctly, then people will like us, then people will love us. We learn really quickly at a young age that love in this world is very conditional, like Aaron had mentioned last week. We learn that if we say the right things and do the right things and people are happy with us, we can get things. And more people will desire us and, and want us. And just the opposite of that, if we fail or we make a big mistake or we make a terrible decision that hurts another person, we can end up on the couch real quick and life is not as fun. And so, I like to think of these two polar opposites. I, I kind of created these two characters in my head. I call them, uh, everyone makes mistakes hippie. <laughs> and then type A Carl. And I'm more, full disclosure, more in the type A Carl uh, <laughs> uh, category. But, if we read scripture, we see this tension that when we see churches battling with faith versus works and salvation issues, it's not an accident because that tension exists in scripture. It exists in life. We see it that we can earn approval and if we don't do the right things, we lose approval. We see it in everyday life, but we also see that concept in scripture, and so there's a lot of verses that when taken out of context or not really studied and not really analyzing every single word within that phrase, there's a lot of verses that can seem like they conflict. And so let's read through some of those verses as everyone makes mistakes, hippie girl, and type A Carl. And so we'll start with uh, 1 John 2. Three through four. And so it says, We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. It's pretty harsh, huh? Type A Carl's like, dang right. <laughs> That's exactly what it means. But then we've got hippie girl coming in with Romans 10.13. It says, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. See, Carl, has nothing to do with what you do. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, regardless of anything else, will be saved. Gotcha. Type A Carl comes back with James 2.19 and says, You believe that there is one God? Good for you! Even the demons believe that and shudder. It has nothing to do with that. And then he says, also, James 2.22-24, and this is in context about Abraham in the Old Testament, you see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. The scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. You see that as a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. So Carl's feeling pretty confident about himself at this point, but then Hippie Crow comes in with a counterpunch and says Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, not by works, so that no one can boast. Boom, hippie girl for the win. Uh-oh, here comes type A Carl with Galatians 3, 1 through 6, and it says, you foolish Galatians, here we go. Who has bewitched you before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly betrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? I'm doing the best I can, Paul. This is confusing. 
After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by the means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain? If it really was in vain. So again, I ask, does God give you the Spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? So also Abraham believed God and it was credit to him as righteousness. Confused yet? <laughs> we see this tension existing that there is something going on where there is great importance in both faith and works. There is something very mysterious and something very essential in how those two things work together. So we see this tension in scripture, we see this tension in life, justice versus mercy, faith versus works, earned outcome, outcome versus unmerited favor. We see it in cancel culture and social justice issues today. It's super popular to, to get on a bandwagon and point the finger and try to get people canceled because of something that they did or something that they said. And there's something really curious about human beings that I've found. That everybody cries out for justice until the moment their own sins are put on trial. Because there's something really important about justice. Justice matters. If you've been wrong, you've been hurt, or someone that you care about has been wrong, you want justice. You want to see the person who hurt you pay for what they did. There is an aspect of that that is very foundational to our core, and it's because justice is core and foundational to God. But when we're the ones who made the mistake, or we're the ones who hurt the person, or we're the ones who, who made the terrible decision, and all the fingers are pointing at us, our natural instinct is, everybody makes mistakes. Are you kidding me? You're going to judge me? What about you? And we cry out for mercy. And so we see this tension. And so where is salvation in all of this tension? What is it to be saved? What is God's part in salvation and what is our part, if any? I think it's easiest to start with where it's not and where I think scripture is very clear that it's not. One, it's not in mere belief of God or even in mere belief in Jesus being the Son of God. And there might be some type A Carls that just went back and said, that's blasphemous. But it's not. As we learn, even the demons believed. Satan knew full well in all of his conversations that he was talking to God himself. He was talking to the Son of God who was going to die on behalf of the sins of the world. And that did not save them. It did not redeem them. It did not heal them. Because they had no reverence for God. They had no desire for God. And they had no desire to walk with God. So the head knowledge of knowing that there is a God, and even knowing that Jesus was the Son of God, will not save us. So where else is it? It is not in works or our ability to fulfill the law. Ephesians 2 8 through 9, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, not by works, so that no one can boast. When I think of that verse, I think of the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the people in the Bible that were the religious zealots. No one on earth has ever fulfilled the law more perfectly than this group of people. They meticulously studied the Torah and the Old Testament. They knew it. They followed it. But their grave mistake is that they felt like that is what saved them. 
And the arrogance that that led to building in their heart made them look down upon everyone else that was not them. They looked in judgment. They looked in pride. That they were somehow special and elite because of what they did, not because of what God did. And that subtle distinction is an enormous distinction because doing good works and following the law and being obedient to God is a beautiful, powerful, essential thing. But it does not save us. And when our focus is on ourselves, that we can save ourselves, the law becomes powerless and it becomes meaningless. And so the three areas that I would say that salvation is found in are these three things. Acknowledgement, acceptance, and relationship. One, acknowledging both that Jesus is the Son of God and acknowledging that I am a sinner. Acknowledging trust in Him and putting your faith in that He is the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father but through Him. Acknowledging those things. I'm about to say something that may offend some people, but I don't care. And I don't care not because I don't care about people or feelings or anything like that, but because this point is more important than potentially offending. Because it's the truth of God, and it matters immensely. I just came across a study the other day that was really disturbing and it broke my heart. And this study asked a bunch of people and in this study 70% of people that considered themselves born again believers, born again Christians, did not believe that Jesus was the only way to heaven. I cannot put more emphasis on this point that we live in a very pluralistic society. We live in a society where enlightenment and all these different paths all lead everyone to the same place. There's a, a prevailing thought that in all the world religions, it's really the same God, but everybody's just looking at him from a different path, and it all leads there. And Christ came to abolish any of that thought, and he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. To be a Christian is to understand that there is one true God, one true God, and there is one advocate, one payment for sin, and that was through the cross of Jesus Christ. To believe that is foundational to understanding that we need to put all of our hope and all of our eggs in the basket, that Christ is what saves us, not ourselves, not our enlightenment, not different paths of different religions and different gods that are named different things. Jehovah is Jehovah. Yahweh is Yahweh. There is one true God, and he said, if you want to come to me, you come through my son. And so the other thing is acceptance. Accepting the gift. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The interesting thing about a gift is that it's not yours until you possess it, until you accept it. In the same way if you were drowning in the ocean and someone threw you a life preserver, it would do you no good until you grabbed it and you put your hope in it. In the same way, Christ offers the gift of salvation through faith to the entire world, 
But those who actually take it, possess it, believe in it, and put their hope in it, they're the only ones who gain the benefit of the gift. And so that third part is relationship. In relationship, a desire to love the other and walk with them. Somebody told me one time, it's not just that you want Jesus to be your Savior, you have to want Him to be your Lord. We can't just use Jesus for forgiveness and forget that following Him is a huge part of that relationship and putting our trust in saying, I don't want to go my way anymore. My way led to destruction. I want to put my faith that your ways are higher than my ways. That you are God and I am not. That I can't save myself. I've messed up. I've made mistakes. I've made terrible decisions. I'm still making terrible decisions. I need an advocate. I need a savior. And so not only am I going to accept that gift and that forgiveness, but I also want to walk with you. In the same way, if you're in a relationship and all you do is take, 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 and you never give, it's not a relationship. A relationship is give and take. A relationship is built on the foundation of trust, that you believe that that other person wants the best for you, that when they're telling you something, they're telling you the truth, that when they ask you to do something, you do it because you love them. And in the context of God, we do it because we love him, but we also do it because we trust that his ways are higher than our ways, that it will lead to life and not to death. That if he's commanding us to do something, it's for a purpose, and it's for our own good, because he loves us, because he cares. I can't emphasize this point enough because all these different scriptures that I shared and that tension between faith and works and so much emphasis on following his commands and doing that stuff. What the word of God is very clear about in the context of all those verses, in the context of the New Testament, is that we will continue to make mistakes. When you come to know the Lord, you're not going to be perfect. We know that. We embrace that. We know that our salvation always is in the cross of Jesus Christ and not our ability to do the right things. But I think what we learn subtly sometimes, even in church and in Christian culture, is that we hear one gospel from the pulpit but a lot of times we can taste a different gospel in our everyday real life. In other words, I remember hearing grace after grace after grace after grace after grace sermon on pulpits growing up and in my time in ministry. But as soon as someone messed up or made a mistake, I saw a lot of ostracizing. I saw a lot of casting out. I saw a lot of judgment. I saw a lot of things that backed up the human condition, human love of if you do the right things and you play the game correctly, you'll be a good Christian and you'll be able to get rewards and you'll be able to do certain things. But if you mess up, you make a bad decision, Talk to the counseling center for you. We gotta figure out what's wrong with you. And when we figure out what's wrong with you, then you can be back on the team. That thing exists within the church. And that tension exists within the church. And the reason why it exists in the church is because that tension exists in scripture. Because 
following after God and being in His will and abiding in Him is important. But grace and salvation rests in the faith of Jesus Christ in the death and resurrection. And as we work out our salvation, we're going to make mistakes. And as believers, we need to have patience with each other and to realize that just because somebody doesn't have something all together that we do, doesn't mean that their spot in the journey is any different than our spot in the journey. The journey of sanctification is a lifelong process of trying to figure out, okay, I'm going to put all of my faith in the basket of Jesus Christ. That is my hope. That is my salvation. That is my righteousness. And working out the rest in fear and trembling of understanding that it matters, that it, that it is evidence of the faith within us, because the Word of God says faith without works is dead. That there's an aspect that if we have faith in Christ, there's going to be fruit. There's going to be evidence. It will not be perfect. It will be messy. We will make mistakes. But the key distinction is that it doesn't matter to us. In a relationship with someone, it matters to us if we love that person, if we've hurt them. It matters to us that we want to do things for them and to trust them and to walk with them. It's got to matter to us how we live our life and that if we're trusting God's commands or if we dismiss him and just say, well, I got Jesus' forgiveness and I don't really want any of the rest. No, it comes all together. Faith without works is dead because it shows that it is not really faith at all. It's just selfish acceptance of forgiveness. Faith in Christ is to take all of Christ and to say, I need a Savior. I have messed up. I am a mess. I need forgiveness. And I also need a Lord. I need a guide. I need someone to follow who knows the path. And I believe that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. And no one goes to the Father but through him. There's a section in scripture that I think shows these two different attitudes of I just want forgiveness and I don't want anything else and the person who wants forgiveness but also wants everything that comes with it. And that's the situation where Jesus was on the crowd, the cross and he had two criminals crucified next to him. In Luke 23, 39-43 it says one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him being Jesus. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him and said, Don't you fear God? He said, Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserved. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. <laughs> we see with the first man, all he wanted was to save himself. I don't know if he believed that Jesus was the Son of God or not, or if he just thought he was a man and he was throwing a Hail Mary. But all he was interested in was saving himself. But the other man, there was an admission of guilt. We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. He understood what he had done. He understood the wages of his sin was death. 
the thing that he earned by making the decisions that he did earned death. And he took that responsibility for himself. The second thing he did was he acknowledged who Jesus was and his ability to save. And then he said, remember me. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That would be a really weird thing to say to some dude sitting next to you on the cross if you didn't believe that he was actually going to go to a kingdom. That phrase tells me that that man looked at Jesus and he saw the context of everything that happened and he knew that this was the Messiah. And in humility and in reverence, he commanded nothing. He just requested this simple phrase, just remember me when you enter your kingdom. So this morning I ask, what are those whispers in your life? Maybe this has really, really profoundly resonated with you, and maybe you're just like, I don't know what the heck you're talking about. <laughs> but what are those lies that you subtly hear the enemy tell you in the midst of shame and in the midst of guilt? in the midst of walking out this thing <clears throat> called salvation. Is the enemy saying, a real Christian wouldn't do that? If they knew what you did, they wouldn't want to be with you anymore. You're too far gone. Or what about the opposite end attack compared to other people you're doing all right? You just need to clean up that one sin and then, then God will accept you again. You see, all of those accusations that Satan does are all focused on you focused on me. Satan wants to do everything he can to take our eyes off of God and on ourselves. Because he knows that we cannot do it on our own. We cannot fulfill the law. We cannot live a life worthy of the gospel. That we need his sacrifice. And so God is asking us to stand in this truth that we are saved through grace, not by works that anyone could boast. Amen? Amen? That our sin and our struggling does not make us lose our salvation. We cannot sin our way out of a relationship with God. 1 John, one, uh, 1 John 2, 1-2 My dear children, I write to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, the Judge. Christ Jesus, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the entire world. Salvation is a gift. Jesus is whispering, accept it, enjoy it, boast in it. Keep walking. Keep your eyes on me. Take your eyes off yourself and off of your sin and lay it at the foot of the cross. Dust yourself off. Get up and try again. We're going to do this together.
together. Trust me that I paid for it. And follow me. Philippians 1, 6, He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of our Christ Jesus. We are in process. We are on a journey. Our actions and our decisions matter. But we are saved through grace. And as we invest in that relationship, there's got to be fruit. There's got to be fruit that we're trusting that he is who he says he is. That there is an element of repentance. That we love God enough to trust him to not do certain things. And that when certain things we fall, we make mistakes, that we feel bad. Not in a shame way, but in a way of saying, that's not the life that I want to live. God's already given me salvation. It's not about earning it. It's about that's not the way that I want to live. I want more for my life. God wants more for my life. I want to love people well. I want to love myself well. I want to follow your commands and I want fruit to come out of my life because I understand that I have no business being in this relationship and you love me anyway. I have no business standing in your presence asking for anything and yet you're giving me the entire keys to the entire kingdom. The wages of my sin was death, but you gave me life. I'm going to end with this illustration. It's from a, a movie that had a really profound effect on me. <coughs> Has anyone seen the movie Saving Private Ryan? Phenomenal movie. It's 20 years old, so... I'd say spoiler alert, but if you haven't seen it by now, it's, that's your problem, so I'm just going <laughs> to spoil it for you. The premise of this movie is that there is a Private Ryan, played by Matt Damon, and he is out in the war field, and there's a group of soldiers that are commissioned to go and find him and pull him safely off of the battle lines, and to bring him home safely. And the lead person of that troop is played by Tom Hanks. And in their journey to find Private Ryan, they go through a bunch of mini battles and many of the people within their troop die. And they finally get to where Private Ryan is after this long journey and seeing their friends die. In the process of finding Private Ryan and trying to pull him off and protect him, Tom Hanks' character is mortally wounded. And they get both of them to safety. And Tom Hanks' character looks at Private Ryan and he says with his last breath, he says a very curious thing. He says, earn it. Now we think of earning things in a very different order. We think we do certain things, we do something, and we earn what we get. In this context, they had already saved his life. fully realizing men died to save his life. And Tom Hanks says, earn it. <coughs> Live a life worthy of the sacrifice that was paid for you. Blood was shed that you might live. And so at the very end of the movie, Matt Damon's character is now an elderly man at the last stage of his life and he goes to the cemetery and he's standing at the gravestone 
of Tom Hanks' character, and he looks at the gravestone, and with tears in his eyes, he says, I did the best I could. He was a man who understood the gravity of the sacrifice that was paid for him. And he made a commitment to live his life to the fullest because he knew that they gave their lives so that he might live and experience the things that he got to experience. And with tremendous gratitude and tremendous gravity, he understood all of that and he said, I did the best I could. The power of that is that he could not earn a gift that was already given to him. It was freely handed to him. And yet he wanted to earn it anyway. He wanted to make it worth it. He wanted to make it matter. And he wanted to profess that he understood what was given to him. I think that is such a powerful illustration of what Christ did for us. He is handing us a gift that he fully paid for and that we do not deserve. And all he's saying is, walk with me. Understand what I did for you, but live a life worthy of the sacrifice that was paid for you. Experience me. Enjoy me. Live life to the fullest. Don't go back to your old ways of sin that you know leads to death, that you know leads to shame, that you know leads to dead ends, that you don't want to go. Put that off and follow me. I've given you the keys to the kingdom. I've given you forgiveness. It's no longer on your shoulders. There is nothing that you can do that can separate my love from you, but I want you to walk with me. Let me show you how to live a life worthy of the sacrifice that was paid for you. I just encourage you, when those whispers come that you're not measuring up, say, dang right. When the enemy says you're not enough and he accuses you, you say, you're right. I can't do it on my own. It's not about me. It's about my God. It's about my Savior. It's about what he did for me, not what I can do for myself. The trick of the enemy is to make you believe that you're your own God. We are not. We are, in the words of a movie I can't think of right now, we are very puny gods. There is one true God. And he is a good God. And he is a God who loves you beyond your wildest dreams. He loves you enough to give you everything free of charge, and his only requirement is, walk with me, experience me, enjoy me, and I will show you what real pleasure is. So we're going to end with a response in worship, but I just encourage you, when those lies come, throw them right back in his faith and point him to the advocate who paid for your sin. Our God is a much more powerful God. And he deserves it. stand as we're able. Oh,
their counsel that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the
a thousand steps further and you say, I desire you. I love you. I see, I see the worst of your sin. And all I see is my son who's paid for it. And I look at my creation, my sons and my daughters, and I say I gave the world for you because I want you, because I care for you, because I love you. Your mistakes do not intimidate me. I conquered them. They are underneath my feet. Walk with me. Enjoy me. And let me show you what life really can God, we love you that you are a good God. And I pray for every single person in this room, no matter where they are at in their journey, no matter what they've experienced, no matter what they've done, that you would silence the whispers of the enemy and that you would show them your glory and bring freedom where there is no freedom right now. Bring freedom where there is shame and guilt. Shine upon them like only you can. God, we love you and we give you this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We didn't really talk about how we're going to close the service, but I think this is where I just dismiss you. <laughs> God bless you. Have a beautiful day. And hopefully I'll see you next week.